This is uh, the road to 8.1. We're talking about Drupal release cycle management. Um, oops. So for those who don't know me yet, oh, there's Jess. I was wondering where she was, uh, was going to show up. <laughs> we just started. You haven't missed anything yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Larry Garfield, or Krell online, uh, senior architect with Palantir. Web services lead for Drupal 8, Fig representative. You've probably heard this all before. Um, I do a lot of Drupal, and I've been heavily involved in Drupal 8. So enough of that. <clears throat> and I want to talk about uh, the upcoming uh, Drupal 8 that is going to be awesome, and we all know this, and there's still a lot of work to do, and we know this, but we need to be thinking long term. So specifically, I want to talk about Drupal 8.1, which is going to be a thing. <laughs> so Drupal 8 is going to go down as Drupal's longest release cycle in history. And for the love of God, let's please never do this again. Let Drupal 8 stand, you know, keep that record for a long, long time. Now, I'm going to say that this probably looking at four-year cycle overall was necessary because we jumped Drupal ahead about eight years in terms of PHP development practices and software engineering practices. So you know, doing that in doing that in four years, actually three, since we didn't even start that heavy work until a year after Drupal 7 launched, pulling that off in three years is pretty good. So round of applause for the core team that's managed to pull that off. <clears throat> but we really don't need to do that level of overhaul every core version. There are you know, things we want to change every version, that's fine. We want to involve, we want to stay relevant, but we don't need to rewrite everything every version. And part of the problem that we ran into is, as usual, we don't know what the length of a release cycle is. We you know, release a Drupal version, and we start work on the next core version immediately, and we work on it until Dries says stop, whenever that is. And sometimes we keep on going even after he says stop, and we just don't listen to him. So what that leads to is a lot of big, uneven plans of different lengths and different complexities that may or may not be possible to do part way which means the release cycle gets longer, and so more, you get more uneven plans, and it just becomes a big muddle. And this is a problem. Most people acknowledge it's a problem. And so at DrupalCon Prague, we had a core conversation uh, where we said, let's try doing something else instead. And um, I put forth a proposal for a new release cycle, which I was the one giving the presentation, but it had been talked about before, and pretty much everyone was on board with immediately which is great, so yay team. Um, <clears throat> and so after some discussion, uh, this is the, the plan for the Drupal 8 release cycle. This is already a done deal, this part. So at some point, we're going to release 8.0.0. Not 8.0, 8.0.0. And this will be as soon as we finish all of those criticals, so go help with that. Uh, and then a month later, we release 8.0.1 bug fix, security fix, and so forth. Just like we do now, we're just adding a zero in the middle. And then another one a month later, and so on, and so on. But six months in, we have a new release, 8.1, that does have new functionality. We will actually have feature ad adding uh, releases for Drupal 8. Yay! And we're targeting every six months for that. <clears throat> and then month seven, 8.1.1. Again, bug fixes, security fixes, the normal maintenance type stuff. At the 12-month mark, we have an 8.2. Uh, then bug fixes on that, and so on and so on for as long as we decide we can still roll with that architecture. We're probably looking at 8.3, 8.4 being where we eventually stop and say, all right, that's an LTS release, meaning no more new feature releases, just security that will keep on going indefinitely. And then we can start looking at Drupal 9. And Drupal 9, I'm recommending we focus just on those things that would be API changes, not functionality changes, not just adding capabilities in Drupal 9 so that we can keep the, that 9 cycle short. <clears throat> so there, there is more to it about you know, security maintenance and um, life, life cycle of Drupal 6 and so forth. I'm not going to get into that here. It's not relevant. But this is, at this point, essentially a done deal for how Drupal 8 is going to work release-wise. Is, is there anyone here for whom this is not old news? 
Good. And we're going to make that statement that in those minor releases in 8.1 and 8.2 and 8.3, we are not going to break APIs on contrib developers. Good. That means people will actually want to upgrade, which is an advantage. For some definition of API, what is an API so that we are going to not break it? That's a kind of important question. <coughs> Sometime last year, if you asked the Drupalcon IRC bot what an API was, this was its answer. <laughs> as long as that's our definition of API, none of this works. Let's be clear. If API is the code exists, we cannot do anything in this regard. So we need a different way to define what an API is. Our old API definition in practice worked more like this. Any line that begins with the word function <laughs> is part of the API, except for those that we mark as private because they begin with an underscore. Except that sometimes that was the only way to accomplish something, and so we couldn't change those either because we knew people were relying on it in contrib. This is not a good definition of an API. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And if it was in an array, it was an API, which, again, means you can't do diddly squat. The reason Drupal has always had this policy of between every release we do, we're allowed to break APIs, is we had an architecture that didn't let us define something as API and something not. So we couldn't evolve a system without breaking something somewhere, potentially. And so we were very conservative about that and said, we either have, you can't do anything or you can break anything. And that dichotomy is a huge problem, especially for contrib developers. Actually, let me pause a moment. Who here identifies themselves as a core developer? Who here would identify themselves as a, a contrib developer? Okay, so pretty good split. That's awesome. <clears throat> Our new architecture in Drupal 8, with all this abstraction we've added around uh, dependency injection around classes, around objects, around interfaces, gives us the ability, if we want to take it, to define what actually is an API in ways that allow us to evolve the system without breaking things for contrib developers every time we sneeze. So if our old pledge was essentially, we won't break modules in minor versions, which was our old promise, the new backward compatibility policy for Drupal 8 reads more like this. We won't break well-behaved modules in minor versions. <laughs> For some definition of well-behaved, we need to define what well-behaved means in order to allow ourselves to evolve. <clears throat> so what makes something well-behaved? A well-behaved module is one that uses parts of the code that we say, as core developers say, is safe. These are parts of the code that you are supposed to be using. And these are parts of the architecture and how it's put together that you're supposed to be using. There will also be large parts of the code base that as a module developer, you are not supposed to touch directly. And if you do, and then something breaks, it's your own fault. Which means we need to make sure that there's enough documentation around which of those is which, and a clear distinction of, okay, we have enough that we're saying is safe, that we're going to guarantee we're not gonna break, that module developers can actually do what they need to do without relying on internal data structures over here or whatever. <clears throat> and I would argue we need to use that documentation problem as a way to drive that separation. We can use the, hey, we need to document what is an API and what isn't as a way for us working on the core team to say, all right, we need to add something here that we can say is not going to change so this other piece can change because we know this piece we probably will want to change a year and a half from now. But pro by providing that extra layer there, we can very clearly say for contrib developers, here's what you're supposed to use. This is the part we're going to promise you. <clears throat> surprise, surprise for me, I recommend we look elsewhere for ideas. Uh, in particular, Symfony has a new backward compatibility policy that they developed uh, with our input, which is great. And uh, they've got a link here. These slides will be up. If you just Google for Symfony BC policy, it should be the first thing that comes up if you want to play along at home. Um, Basically, it comes down to tagging uh, classes and interfaces and so forth with more documentation tags that have very specific meaning about how stable something is. So um, 
oversimplified uh, description of what they have. Interfaces, if it's tagged API, then you as a consumer of that, as someone using it, you can use it as a type hint, you can use it as, you can implement classes using it, and you can extend that interface with your own interfaces and be pretty confident it's not going to break on you in the next version. You can be very confident in that, you know, we're not going to change those out from under you. If it's not tagged, if it's uh, tagged internal and you use it and it disappears in the next version, well, we told you so. Uh, <clears throat> and if it's not tagged at all, then you can, it's safe to, to use and implement, but not to extend. Actually, I may have the implement one wrong there now that I think about it. But anyway, there are three different levels of the guarantee around this won't change on you. For classes, and it works essentially the same way. Something tagged API, um, you can do pretty much any with, anything with. The class is done. Aside from adding private methods and uh, properties, you're probably going to rely on that code never changing. Uh, if, again, if it's marked internal and you use it and it goes away, we told you so. And uh, otherwise, some things are safe, but not everything. Again, the Symfony documentation has a very long list of the exact things you're allowed to do to a class uh, when it's tagged one of these things. We do not necessarily need to follow that exactly. I think it's a good starting point. We may want to tweak it and have something slightly different than Symfony in this regard. That's okay. It's just a very good place to start. Um, and on, on classes, they do say methods can be tagged separately. This, I think, is really important because there's a lot of places where I think we'll want to keep, you know, make a, a class safe but keep its constructor uh, private so that we can still add services to it without breaking something else. And we can discuss some use cases for that. Uh, their documentation does not address traits at all, but since uh, Drupal 8 is going to have traits in it, I would say, when I say class, uh, assume I mean class or trait. So then, this is essentially what our new pledge for module developers for Drupal 8 should be. We won't break things that are tagged API. And for normal stuff, if we're going to change it, it will be noted in release notes. And it should be a minor change, so upgrading for that should be a really easy task. We'll make it as easy as possible. You may have a little bit of work, but not a great deal. <clears throat> so think of it like, you know, like views occasionally will add something, you need to make a slight tweak to it in Contrib that we're already used to that, Core can do the same. <clears throat> All right, so what are we going to tag as our stable, supported, guaranteed API? This is not an easy question. I have guidelines that I want to recommend, but these are not, uh, some people are getting it, these are not, <laughs> not hard rules. <clears throat> uh, so at a strategic level, we have a policy right now that security fixes or will trump anything. If the only way to fix a security hole is to break an API, we break an API in the name of security. That's already the policy. I think we just keep on doing that. It's a good policy. Let's you know stay with that. <clears throat> uh, I've got recommendations here, but this is going to require case by case thought. There is no you know define a rule once and then uh, deploy pattern applying minions to the core to apply. We have to actually think this through in different places and make good, educated decisions. And that's a good thing. It forces us to reason about our code and how we want it used, rather than just blindly applying some rule. I think this is actually a responsibility of the subsystem maintainers, primarily. <clears throat> um, they know their systems better than random core people. This is their responsibility as a subsystem maintainer, which also means we should, in most cases, defer to subsystem maintainers. Not always, but you know, if they're responsible for this part of the code base, they're responsible for what part of this code base is the API and which isn't. So you know, this is a conversation we will need to have with all the subsystem maintainers um, over time. <coughs> and as, as probably the strongest proponent in Drupal of never ever using the private keyword, I'm going to say we might want to start using it for things we mark as API, because that is an extra level of this is not part of the API. API for something that is ex you know extending is that's still an API. So I I am going to be flexible on this point. So which part of that?
Correct. So for the recording, if you have if you have a class that is tagged API and has protected stuff on it, we are saying therefore that those protected properties and protected methods are part of the API of that class for its child classes. If you want to exclude something from that API for child classes, you can make it private. Uh, there's actually another way of approaching this I've seen, which is tagging methods as API or not. Uh, that's actually something in Fabien. Um, no, no, it was not Fabien who pro proposed that originally, I think. But the, there's a lot of discussion around you know, protected versus private, and one of the key points there that I've seen is something being public or uh, protected as in the language is not the same thing as being part of the API in scare quotes. So <clears throat> just you know, should, we should not assume that public means public API and protected means child class API. We should think beyond that and maybe even just tag things as in this class, these three protected methods are part of the API for child classes and these three are not but they're still protected for some other reason. So again, this goes back to we need to think these things through case by case and make well-informed decisions. <clears throat> also, just because we tag something internal doesn't mean that we are going to be free to change it at any time. Internal says, as a module developer, you should not rely on this thing, not a promise that we're going to change it. If we can add some new feature or improve something without changing an internal class, that's still better than breaking it if we don't have value to. But we reserve the right to change this if necessary. <clears throat> Some general rules. Uh, again, all of these are open to discussion. I would argue we should always treat our database schema as internal. This is a big change from previous versions where, no, yeah, no hook schema alter. If you write direct queries against the, an SQL table that is not your own, you are doing it wrong. I, I've said this uh, before a couple times in Drupal 8. I spent a lot of time in Drupal 7 building up this great new database API, and in Drupal 8, I'm going to tell you not to use it because we have much more robust APIs on top of it that will let you, you know, build a module that will work on SQL, Mongo, Redis, whatever, you know, transparently. If you have a reason to use your own table f uh, for something, then that's your table, fine. You know, that, that's your API. But any tables created by core should be treated as internal and not something contrib developers can rely on the schema for. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's views makes that a lot easier to say, actually, as does EFQ. Uh, tests. Don't even bother tagging them. Test classes themselves are internal always. The test base classes are like any other class because changing those would break a whole lot of tests. But an actual test for something is not part of the API, which means all those people working to get rid of simple test and move over to uh, PHP unit or to BHAT, keep going, please. You can still do that in Drupal 8. You know, all of the actual test classes in Drupal 8 we can replace without it being an API break. There's really no reason contrib developers should be relying on those in the first place. So keep on working on that. You know, never stop, please. Um, controllers. This one. Uh, I'm a bit contentious on myself. In practice, a well-written controller is just glue code. There's nothing in there in, that's interesting. If there is, it should be factored out to a service, which means we can get away with saying our controllers are always going to be internal. So contrib developers should not rely on the individual controllers of some core module um, not changing on them. Again, they're unlikely to change, but we're not going to promise that they won't. <coughs> However, a lot of this means we've got all these YAML files, and in many cases, the structure of that file is the API. What happens behind it is not. This is your entry point to the system is set up a YAML file in a certain way. That's the part that's the API, not the actual PHP code. <coughs> I, would, I would say, um, as a, some general guidelines here, we have a lot of services uh, in the container that are tag services, so to find some service, give it a certain tag in the container, and magic happens and it gets wired into the system. The interface that you have to implement for those services and the name of the, the uh, uh, tag in the container, those are both APIs. That's the only part that's an API. Uh, however, the class that we will inject all those into, that's internal. 
Again, the API is I provide this class and I tag it this way. What happens after that is not part of the API guarantee. So uh, I'm going to talk about breadcrumbs as a good example of this later on. <clears throat> um, if we have classes that we intend to be extended, a lot of these uh, base classes like uh, entity or controller base and so forth, we're providing those as something you are supposed to extend. That means that is an API. And those are the classes where we probably want to lock it down tight with private variables <coughs> or uh, private properties. However, a lot of those base classes we should break into traits. Some of this is already happening. It needs to happen faster because <coughs> some things on those base classes we want to be public API, some we want to be private. It's a lot easier to differentiate if they're broken out into separate traits. And then some of those traits can be internal and some of them can be public or uh, API. Uh, it also forces us to think through how we want developers to interact with our system. Not how we think they might, how we want developers to think through our system, which means treating module developers as users of our code and applying the same you know, user experience concepts to developers as we do to end users in the browser. For plugins, most of the time, I would say, whatever the interface is for a given plugin is an API, and all the manager guts should be internal. There will be exceptions to that. But we want to define small surface areas. Good small surface areas, but small surface areas. That helps keep code loosely coupled, gives us more flexibility, and communicates to module developers, hey, this is the right, quote unquote, way of doing things. For things in the container, we should go through and mark most of them private. In uh, the Symfony dependency injection container, you can tag a service as private, which means you can't access it from container get. You can still inject it as a dependency to some other uh, service. That's fine. But you can't access it at random. This, again, says things that we, you're not supposed to be dealing with directly, you can make private. For example, route enhancers. Those are just an internal part in, of the routing system, the internal implementation detail. I'll say now, there is absolutely no good reason for a contrib developer to, developer to pull out a route enhancer from a controller or from a form. You don't want to be using those services inside uh, a controller or a form. If you're doing that, either you're doing something stupid or we did something stupid because you can't do something without doing that. So someone did something stupid if that's going on. If we see that, we can fix it by doing something not stupid instead. But we need to uh, give ourselves this trigger. Any public services we have, however, must have an interface. No exceptions. Having an interface gives people the flexibility to swap something out without playing games with extending classes. <coughs> um, the names of the services that we don't make private, those are part of the API. So the router. We may change stuff inside the router, but the service name router, that is not going to change. We can promise that. Um, the entity manager, whatever its the name in this container is, I think it's entity.manager at this point, or whatever that is, that name is not going to change. The guts of the code that come of the class that comes back, that can change. The uh, tag itself will not. Um, I would actually, you cannot put you know, at API into a YAML file. I'm just saying we should document as part of our overall documentation strategy. If you have a service in, your, in the container that is not marked private, then that name of a service cannot change for the life cycle of Drupal 8. We may add more, but the name of that service will not change. So uh, outcome of this conversation should be we go write some kind of API uh, definition document based on this end discussion, which will include that statement, assuming people don't throw tomatoes at me for that. <clears throat> for those YAML files, um, as I said, the tags we put on uh, services, that's part of an API. The uh, keys in routing YAML files, that's part of an API. The code that's triggered by it, however, is not. So as an example, in the routing system right now, you can specify a lot of magic keys that do various things. So you can say underscore form. 
here's a class, so that's a form that we're going to show at this page. Great. Uh, entity view, whatever the entity is in the uh, parameter, show the view version, you know, full view version of that entity at this page. Great. That is the API. The fact that we have two layers of wrapping objects that process this to make it work, that is not part of the API. The API is you put underscore form in your routing YAML file and a form shows up. How it shows up is not part of the API. The code behind these is not API because it's the behavior, not the code, that module developers are going to be relying on. Config API, um, I would say in most cases, we treat we can treat the, um, the keys as an API if people are going to be loading those. However, sometimes we'll have some kind of wrapper around them so we don't want contrib developers accessing some other modules config objects directly. This one, honestly, I don't know. I'd like input from the CMI team on it because they're going to have a better idea here than I am. Again, this is proposals for conversation starting. And other random stuff. Um, we do have a lot of third-party interfaces from Symfony or elsewhere. Many of those are already tagged API by Symfony, which means we are, can be pretty safe. They're not going to change on us when we upgrade to Symfony 2.6 in core, for example. <clears throat> um, for those that are not, we can consider putting an empty extension on them. So some interface in Symfony, we have an interface in Drupal that is the same name and just extends it and does nothing else that gives us a place to futz with it and add some backward compatibility pieces if necessary, if Symfony changes something on us. We don't necessarily need to do this everywhere, but it's something we can look at doing um, if we th think we're at risk of something changing upstream. I don't think the other libraries we're relying on beyond, beyond Symfony have this well-defined uh, of an API definition, so we may want to do that more for others. I think this is when it's open to debate. Um, if we have a base class, that is intended to fulfill an interface and it actually is not a trivial implementation of the interface, we probably should just fix that problem in the first place. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at block base. Who's looked at block base? <laughs> the block interface and the block base class have almost nothing in common. So before we make block base an API, let's fix that problem. We need to refactor that piece so it's stable. And this is, again, a place where all right, what do we document? Oh, that doesn't make any sense. Let's fix that before we document it. Documentation can be a good architectural driver. <clears throat> form arrays. Core has lots of form arrays all over the place. Almost all of them should be internal because if we say we cannot touch a form array, then we basically can't change anything in core. We cannot improve the UI at all. So obviously, if we don't have to, to uh, break a form, Let's not, but most forms we should say, we are not going to guarantee that your alter hook will never ever break. It probably won't, but we're not going to promise it. We may want to make an exception for the node form, however. I think that's debatable. That's you know, the most commonly altered form, I would suspect, or the one that's most likely to do weird things if it changes and there's an alter. Um, so we may have some exceptions like that. But overall, all of these big arrays Arrays are not an API. If you rely on random naked data structure as if it were an API, either you're going to break something or you're telling someone else they can't improve things. Neither of these is good. So where we still have these arrays, we should assume that they are not part of the API. The key definitions are, you know, the form element number is going to be the form element number. Where it is in a given form, or if a given form uses a table versus um, you know, pre and post fix or whatever, that's not part of the API. Just the array definition itself is. All right, this is a lot of uh, abstract stuff. Let's see some of this in practice. Um, again, these are examples of how I would recommend documenting these particular systems. All of this is subject to debate and or tomato throwing. <clears throat> Breadcrumb system. We don't actually have a maintainer for right now. Um, but it's nice and small, and it was mostly written at this point by two or three people, one of whom is me, so I'm comfortable talking about this one. The breadcrumb builder interface, actually, who has been following how the breadcrumb system works in D8 now? Okay, not most people. So, breadcrumbs in D8 now, instead of a function you call and hope you, you get called after someone else has called it to set a breadcrumb, 
we have a series of breadcrumb builder services, which will apply or not given the conditions on the page. And then we have a, um, a manager class that's when a breadcrumb block, which is an actual block now, uh, displays, it will call that service and say, all right, get me the breadcrumb as defined by whichever the first service is that says, I care. This gives us a much more um, deterministic way of dealing with breadcrumbs, much simpler, and you don't need to go grepping for who called Drupal set breadcrumb and did they do it too late for me to get in after them. That's a terrible thing. We actually have a breadcrumb system in Drupal 8 that doesn't suck. Woo! <clears throat> so each of these breadcrumb uh, builder objects, if they have an interface. That interface is probably part of the API. We tag that. That's pretty much not going to change at all. The tag you use in the uh, container, you breadcrumb builder, you define your service, tag it that, it gets wired up, you're done. That's part of the API. The name breadcrumb for the service, which right now is registered to that manager, but you could wire a breadcrumb builder to it directly, which is awesome. That's part of the API. That's it. The interface for uh, that uh, chain of responsibility manager that will you know, try each one in, in turn. Probably that's normal. I doubt we're going to change it, but we might. And the manager class itself we've got now, that's internal. If you rely on this particular implementation of wiring these together, I'm not going to promise to you that this won't change. As the, uh, not the maintainer of that subsystem, but someone who probably would qualify as, I'm not going to promise you that this won't change. I can say these won't change, but not this one. That's the kind of thought process we want to go through. Other people may break this down differently, but this is the exercise we want to go through. <coughs> um, breadcrumb builder base, get rid of it. I think we can just eliminate this class entirely. All it is right now is a wrapper around two traits, with the um, translation trait and link trait as soon as we create it. It hasn't been created yet. Once we factor uh, the, the link generator, utility methods out to a trait, this entire class will just be using two traits. At that point, it's no longer useful. People can use a trait in their builder class directly, and then they understand what's going on a lot better. So in this case, thanks to traits, we can just eliminate this entirely, and that solves the question of whether it's an API or not. I think that's a, a good thing. <clears throat> Look at something a bit more complex here. Again, this is open to uh, debate. I would say this is the API of uh, the routing system. The route filters, the route enhancers, and the fragment interface. These are both from Symfony CMF, not from Drupal. So we may want to have our own local interfaces that wrap it. Uh, just, they aren't extending it. That's fine. The, and then some of our utility base classes, all exceptions, and the object that uh, contains the, res the results of a block or of your controller. <coughs> Some of these other interfaces that you're probably never going to implement yourself, but you're going to use as a service. So URL generator um, so, and stuff like that, controller resolver interface. Pretty much no one is going to use this one in, in practice. It's all internal. But I'm being generous here since that comes from Symfony originally. Um, route builder and route provider. Unless you're writing an alternate backend for the routing system, say for MongoDB or Redis or whatever, which actually yesterday someone showed me a prototype of the routing system using Redis as a backend, which I think is seriously cool. You know, there's maybe five modules that will actually care about those. Most module developers won't even know they exist. That's fine. These don't need to be part of the rock solid API. If we ever do need to change something on these, there's five modules that will care and we can just communicate to them. Um, and then again, these only really useful for uh, a small number of people to actually want to ever change, so they don't need to be part of the, the fully public API. And pretty much everything else is internal. There's a lot of, I went through the routing system, there's actually a lot of classes in there, most of which module developers should not ever care about. It, most of that directory is an implementation detail. So all this dumping stuff, you're never going to touch that. Um, the URL matter, you're not going to touch that. The route provider implementation we have right now, you're not going to touch that. All this stuff about route compiling, no. The filters and enhancers, the interface is the API. 
the particular classes we have in core that accomplish the stuff they're accomplishing now, the fact that it's accomplished is the API. The fact that we will, you know, route based on the, uh, the uh, method of an HTTP request and that we'll return the correct uh, error message if uh, the, it can't match. That's the API. The fact that we use a route filter for that is not part of the API. The existence of route filters is the API, but not the specific classes we have. So I would tag all of these as internal. So if all of this stuff is internal, what is the API of the routing system? It's a, not a small amount of code. What is the API of it? In this case, this is the API. The 98% use case for interacting with the routing system is the routing YAML file. For the vast majority of module developers, that's the extent of the API you actually care about. That's the part we promise. The fact that there is a underscore title uh, property or a title callback property, that's API. The content and controller uh, methods, that's API. The fact that if you specify content, we set a controller and wrap it, and it's a, this particular class that we wrap it with, not part of the API. Don't rely on that. Same thing with form. The API is, if you specify underscore form and a class name, you get a, that form at that URL. That's it. Details of what happens behind the scenes to make that happen are not your problem. Um, the fact that we can route based on format and method, uh, the entity uh, keys for all of those things, that's API. Um, you know, permission for uh, doing access check this way. What happens behind the scenes to make the permission check happen is irrelevant, but we won't change the fact that underscore permission means you need to have this permission. We may expand this to say, oh, you can say access content overview plus whatever, so you need to have two permissions. But your existing code will, uh, is fine, and if we can't it, add that functionality without breaking that horribly, we won't have that functionality. And we need to accept that as core developers, hey, there's things we won't be able to do. <clears throat> and when we find things that we want to do but can't, there are ways to work around that. Um, for example, if we want to extend a class or rename it, we can do something like this. We've got a class called Book Manager right now in uh, the book module, fine. Let's say that's tagged API, or maybe internal. Um, so we can, in core at some point, in 8.1 or 8.2, extend it and create a new one, which it's been argued that it should be called book repository in the first place, so let's use that name. And then stuff in core that we can control can start relying on the new one and do whatever the new stuff is. Anything in contrib, it's still relying on this one, but this will, uh, class matches all the same interfaces and type checks, so it can still type check the old one and still do what it's going to do, and it's not going to break. This is okay. And at this point, I would say probably book repository should not be marked API. Maybe internal, maybe normal, debatable, case by case. But this gives us some flexibility and builds up only a little bit of cruft. With interfaces, say we have you know, some interface that's tagged to API, we want to do something new in a way that our rules won't let us, extend the interface, put new stuff on it, and then our um, code that is dependent on that interface can just do a check internally. And if it's the old style interface, assume some things. If it's the new style inter interface, assume others. This code in here is not part of any API anywhere, but this lets us allow contrib modules to still pass in that old interface, and we can deal with old or new versions. This will build up cruft in the system. That's okay, because we know about it. And anytime we do that, anytime we add this, hey, we're working around our BC pledge here, immediately file an issue assigned to Drupal 9 to sort that out. That gives us you know, maybe an extra issue tag, I don't know. But that gives us, when we do open Drupal 9 development, whenever that is in a couple of years, we have a hit list of Here's the cleanup we can just go through and do immediately. These are all API breaks, but it's just going to clean up a lot of that cruft, do that first, blitz through that in a month or two, and then we can start from whatever actual things we want to do for D9. And we've got that tracking in place, and we can very easily um, signal what we're doing in the future, especially if we can be thinking ahead to D9 and saying, oh, 
We're going to want this book repository thing or this enhanced interface for D9. We know that. We're going to provide that in D8. Contrib modules that want to require 8.2 and later can use that new interface, which then doesn't change for D9. Great. It's a much smoother transition path. Less work for modules to update to D9 later because they can do it in bits and pieces as long as we are careful about it. I will give a, a warning, however. This is the very first time that Drupal has tried to do something like this. And I said, it's going to require thought. It's going to require um, thinking things through. It's going to require planning, all of which we are rather bad at because we have very inexperienced that. Planning is not something Drupal is used to doing. We are going to screw this up. I will say this now. We are going to screw up and find ourselves looking at a piece of code and saying, holy, I can add this functionality to be awesome if I just fix this one little thing, but that would be an API break. Drat. We should look at that as a learning experience, culturally, and then do it better in D9. We are going to hurt ourselves in core by doing this, and we need to, because that's how we learn how to build better, more abstracted, more loosely coupled APIs that will give us more freedom in the future. So let's learn by failure and see what things did we get right in Drupal 8 that give us the flexibility we want, and what things did we just not do right, either architecturally or in terms of documentation or whatever. And let's also remember, we can raise the guarantee on something. We can't lower it. If we have something tagged internal and later decide, you know what, this is safe to just release, take that internal tag off in 8.1 or 8.2 or 8.3, that's OK. Something's tagged normal, we're like, all right, we're done with this one now. It's A2. We know we're not going to change this one again. It, we're happy with it. Move that up to API. He can't go the other direction, which means for right now in 8.0, let's be very conservative. Let's not tag things API just because we think someone might use it. If we are confident this is the public API and we are confident we do not need to change it ever again until Drupal 9, then we can tag it API. If we think we might need to, Let's give ourselves a more wiggle room and communicate to module developers, here's what we are promising, here's what we are not promising, and get feedback from that. And we'll probably get feedback from contrib developers saying, hey, this thing, I'm, I have to use this, so either give me another way or don't break it. And we can then do that, which is something we've not been able to do before. So that's my proposal. That's uh, my recommendation for how we manage this. Let's discuss and then probably have a, a boff or a meeting on Friday to start turning these thoughts into uh, an actual BC policy. Thanks. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, Larry, is, do you feel particularly, because we are probably going to get this wrong um, at the beginning, that there's benefit in having more granularity in what, we, um, um, what kind of tags we might use? Um, so some examples I'm thinking of would be something like having a um, API candidate tag, um, something like that, that might say, well, we, this is something that we want you to use, but we're not necessarily saying that this is fully baked yet or fully stable yet. Because um, tagging effectively everything is internal, mm -hmm. it then becomes harder for contrib developers to distinguish, well, is this something that we don't intend you to use or just not ready yet? Maybe. That's an interesting idea. The challenge is we could very easily have way too many levels, and it becomes too confusing. But maybe if having a fourth level for probably API or beta API, that might be useful. I'm not sure yet. Um, uh, I, microphone. With the API candidate tag, I would only suggest that we include a link to the issue where you can discuss why it is a candidate. Because knowing it's a candidate isn't much without the ability to, I guess, mm -hmm. upvote or downvote its candidacy. That makes sense. Discuss and discuss what might be wrong with it yeah. for the model that wants to implement it. Um, so I, 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 overall, I think that the way that you've broken down the different, put the different parts of our code base and made recommendations is very helpful. But I also noticed that there is there is an enormous documentation effort here. First of all. Mm -hmm. There is an enormous um, like thought process effort, and you're also recommending some rearchitecture. Um, and at, I need to point not out, much. <laughs> not you, you promise it's not much. Okay. I don't think there's a, a lot of rearchitecture so, happening. Uh, that here. was my actually my first question when you started talking about mm -hmm. this is like, 
are we in AAA actually really, really at the point where what we say, which is that we modernized our architecture and therefore we, we can make changes without breaking BC, are we really at that point? Because I think that the Drupal 8 cycle has been a learning experience for everyone who works on core. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a follow-up point to that question. But I'll leave. I think we are certainly closer to it than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. Whether we're closer n enough or not, we won't know until we try. Mm -hmm. And that's why I recommend subsystem maintainers go through and look at their systems and say, all right, what parts of this can I now guarantee and what can't I? And if you end up with, boy, I can't guarantee anything, that's a problem. Let's fix that. And better to know that now than a year from now. I'm hoping that's a small number, but things like, you know, get rid of breadcrumb base. That's a small thing. It's, I wouldn't call that a re-architecture, but I think it is a smart thing to do. That leads me to my second question, which is, um, are you possibly, and I think the answer is yes, it's a loaded question, are you possibly <laughs> overestimating the involvement, time availability, uh, Drupal 8 awareness, and confidence of component maintainers? Because I have found that group of people in the course of trying to get them to do stuff uh, to be very inconsistent in their level. There's, there's, there's people who are extremely active in Drupal 8. Um, there's, there's a third or half of our components that have no maintainer at all. And then there's components where the, the, the maintainer might pop in once every three or four months to say, this is a horrible idea, and then go away again. So, I did the breadcrumb and routing examples on the plane on the way here from Chicago. If you are paying attention to core, it's not a large task to do a first okay. cut. For those components that don't have a maintainer, that's a problem. We should probably find someone. And we should not rely exclusively on component mm -hmm. maintainers for this. But they should be the one driving the conversation in their areas. And that leads me to my point, which is that um, I all of this is something that we need to do, and we definitely need to have a policy for 8.0. Mm -hmm. um, but my recommendation, and I think you sort of got this, my recommendation would be that we start with the, ba the bare obvious minimum, things like, you know, controllers, render arrays, those, those don't make good APIs. So we can start by saying we will, we, we will consider breaking those in 8.1 and, and start with like the most important things for the API level. But I am very concerned, I want to remind everyone that we are um, 15 issues, it's actually 14 issues because Dries is just <laughs> behind this week, um, away from a beta release candidate, which means, in theory, that our APIs are stable-ish enough already out for Contrib. Um, at, least the, at least the ones that we've defined as critical APIs, which includes um, the entity field API, the plugin system, the routing system, and the configuration management system, and the theme layer. Um, yeah, and I, and I would say, all right, what does it mean that when we say that the entity API is stable enough for Contrib? What parts of it? All 50 classes or just these eight? That's the question that we need to answer. Whether we answer that, you know, whether answering that is a beta blocker or well, an RC no, blocker no, is a separate no, no, no. question. It's, it's not a beta blocker. The, the point that I'm trying to make, <laughs> I'm yeah, making that executive I, decision right now. The point that I'm I, trying I would to agree make with is, you on that myself. Um, is not that can we change more later. The point that I'm trying to make is we need to stop changing crap. Mm -hmm. Because right now we are, over, we are already over the length of the Drupal 7 release cycle. Now the first year was kind of a dead zone, but it's still been a very long time since people had a new version of Drupal. Mm -hmm. Drupal 8 is freaking amazing. It is a huge advancement over Drupal 7. It is modern. The code base is better. The functionality is much better. Um, and it, there is a serious, serious risk to the ecosystem, the commercial ecosystem we all rely on if we continue to put off the delay of that release. Um, so if this is something that, and when you talk about it, it frightens me because it's <laughs> like, this is good planning that we should do, but I would like what we need, 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 need to do is instead focus on, in fact, minimizing the, the API change and, mm -hmm. and like, you know, bike shedding and perfecting that we do both in terms of like how we, how we invest our time and in terms of the code base itself so that we can you know, decide, ugh, you know, this, is, this API is hideous, but we can live with it and we're going to live with it so mm -hmm. that we can get to release. And um, yeah, I, The situation is, is kind of urgent. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree with you at all on that okay. point. Um, so then I guess it just serves as a reminder for everyone. <laughs> um, while I think like, in, input on this is amazingly valuable, um, focus your ener energies on it, at least on the APIs that matter most mm -hmm. if you're going to spend time trying to make these decisions. Like think, things like thinking about what in the entity system, that's a great example. Like yeah. think about what in the entity system really, really needs to be stable, but at the same time don't take 
time away from fixing the entity system so that it's ready for release because there's a lot of criticals yeah. out there. And still. the contrib people in, in the room who don't really work yeah. on core, this is a great time to give us feedback on what parts of this are you going to want to use as an API that we should then tag as API. You know, we want that feedback so we can be intelligent about this. I should probably say for the recording, um, my name is Jess. I'm XJM. I work for Dries in the office of the CTO, and my full-time job is Drupal 8 release management, so that's why I'm being in that. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, first I have uh, just a statement that has to shape some thoughts and maybe get some feedback on it. Um, so as a more of a contrib developer, um, some of these decisions about like what's API and what's internal, um, like I would never look at L, the link f linking function, as something I would change, right? It's like don't hack core, like mm -hmm. obviously. But now, you know, what you're presenting is essentially saying that you know, for contrib developers, it's going to be harder for them to understand, like, what's L and what's not now, right? Since this is object-oriented, you can extend things and take things. You know, you're trying to set up something that says, like, here's an indicator that this is something that you shouldn't change, right? Because, um, like, obviously, L, I would not never refer to it as an API, but it's a function that you use and rely on. Um, but I guess I would kind of take the parameters of L as an API. So um, in shaping the conversation about like how do we document this, I think for people who aren't familiar necessarily mm -hmm. like with what's going on is just saying like, think about it like L, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, we will change the inner workings of link because it's what routing is doing. And like, it's kind of a no brainer that you're not gonna, mm -hmm. unless you're like forking and hacking, like working on core, you're not gonna try to extend a route enhancer and modify it. So I think exactly. there can be lines that are drawn to help with the massive documentation effort to use people's existing experience with D7 mm -hmm. to kind of onboard them to that. Yeah. So and to, to that example in particular, that's why um, I believe I had the URL generator interface, right. which is yes. where the contents of L now live. Yeah. That interface is part of the API. The class we have that is the default implementation is not. So we could change the class, swap it out to whatever else, and the interface is still ch not changing, and that's what you as a module developer are, are relying, right. relying on, the, the function name and the parameters to it, essentially. That's the API that you can rely on. The fact that, oh, I'm on this particular site, for whatever reason, I'm going to extend the generator class, do something different. I'm not going to promise you that that extending of that class is never going to break. Right. I am going to promise that the interface you're relying on in a module that's calling the L function or calling the generate method is not going to break. And that's the distinction we need to be able to make. My other thing was just about uh, like deprecation mm -hmm. and having uh, deprecated functions. So that's, uh, that's when you brought up the example of thing. like uh, tagging things as like, tagging it as with a D9 issue that mm -hmm. says like we've got cruft now um, and we should get rid of this in D9. I was just wondering if people are thinking about, well, maybe marking things as deprecated in minor point releases or uh, even carrying that through. I mean, it's a, a question of how large you want the code base to grow. What, you know, what do you really want the developer community mm -hmm. to do with these types of uh, you know, API changes for major versions? I was just wondering what thoughts are around deprecation. So we are using de uh, at deprecated already in core, mostly to indicate we haven't deleted this thing yet, but we're going to before 8.0 releases. I am completely in favor of using deprecated within the Drupal 8 cycle. Say, hey, you know, here's this new interface that's going to replace the old one. It hasn't yet. Here's the issue in D9 to actually delete the old one. The old one is marked deprecated. So contrib developers, you probably want to start using the new one, but the old one's still going to work for now. And if you start using the new one now, great, you're already halfway to being D8 or D9 compatible. Right. So, so I am completely in favor of using deprecated yeah. so then appropriate. Just to reiterate, deprecation really only stands for a major version, and then all deprecated functions will be removed in the next major release, right? For anything that is API or normal, I would say yes. Uh, you deprecate something, we don't actually delete it until, until D9. Right. Thank you. So I had two quick thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, one was going off of Jess's point about, you know, I think this is a great idea. I, I love the the concept of it uh, mm -hmm. as a developer, as a, as a contrib maintainer especially, it's like knowing what I can use safely. But if it's something that's too big or you know, that we're really concerned is going to push out D8, I agree that we're sort of, we're already 
I got kind of a, a feeling I got from Chris's keynote was like, next year's the experience web using his term, and next year's the first time that D8 will mm-hmm. hopefully get out, and that's the end of the assembled web. <laughs> <laughs> By his own keynote, we're sort of lagging a little bit there, and so I I would agree with the concern that that may be pushing it beyond that. So maybe something to think about if it's not pushing this too far is. Is this an 8.1 feature itself? I would say no, because if we do none of this until then, then people try, trying to build modules on 8.0 have six months of, oh. However, no different than Drupal ever? No. We stopped, we stopped breaking things uh, for core releases in the past. Yeah, just think about it. Instead, we might have six months of, I want you to mark this as a stable API. Uh, yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. Well, then, so taking that uh, for the recording, the suggestion is, you know, six months of contrib developers having feedback for what should be the stable API, fine, but then that means, you know, taking to its logical conclusion, 8.0 doesn't have any API guarantees on it at all, so who's going to be dumb enough to develop for that? I think we need to do some of this before 8.0, and, <laughs> and it should not hold up the release by any significant amount. Microphone, microphone. He's saying whatever it will generate the default node page? That's, that's it. That's it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, pot- potentially. Um, so, I think to Jess's point earlier, I'm not suggesting we refactor f- five different systems entirely just for putting tags on it. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm, <laughs> I would kill me. <laughs> I'm suggesting things like, oh, how would we document breadcrumb base? Oh, we don't actually need it. So that's a, a very simple change to make. I'm expecting more things like that. That's one issue to fix in core. That's not a big deal. Any kind of refactoring we do just for the documentation purposes is at that level as far as I'm concerned, not at the, oh, let's change these 12 classes. If we have to change these 12 classes for something, we've already screwed up, and we're just in damage control mode. And yeah, that should not block a release. So the, the second thing that sort of a, a thought or a request is if we do get to the point where we have core really nicely tagged like this and we mm-hmm. can actually do some analysis on <coughs> contrib modules, it would be a fantastic service. I don't know if this is something we'd want in contrib itself, maybe something in coder, but I think even better would be something on DDO itself that says to module maintainers, hey, new core release. By the way, you're not using three deprecated classes. Yes, please. So some sort of method or system that tells you you're using six unsafes and three deprecates. You should seriously look at mm-hmm. updating your thing to work with the latest release. So if anyone who wants to work on that, once I, this is in place, I would love that. I love this idea. <laughs> so just <laughs> thought for everyone. Just a thought that bounces off of that. You know, as a, somebody who's looking for a place to contribute, it would be nice to go through, as, as many of us do at mm-hmm. nights, on Friday night, we just obsessively look, look through <laughs> all the different modules that are available just to see to find something new. I know you all do that. I do that. Um, so that Stop describing my life. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're twins. Um, so that you can find which modules have work to do. And so you can jump in their issue queue and just, oh, I can fix that. I'm, I'm good with fixing that. You could be like a, a road warrior that way. But I, um, I'm just basically wanted to say I'm happy. I love your talk. Somewhat disappointed because I thought the talk was going to be about what are we doing right now in the issue queues in order to get things ready for the 8-point release that we can shove to 8.1. Because it seems like we, there has been no conversation about what is 8.1, what are, what's out there in the issue queues that's unresolved right now that can be pushed safely to 8.1. There has been some discussion of that. It's not all that formal at the moment. Um, but yes, there, that is a whole conversation unto itself that I'd be interested in having too. Is it is it off topic for your talk? Or um, can I respond to it? Let Steve go first, and, the, and okay. then we can jump to it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wanted to ask if if parts of this can be reframed um, for contrib's responsibility or for individual sites' responsibility. We already have some soft conventions around how individual sites keep track of the things they hack with mm-hmm. either patches.txt or just keeping the patch files around. Like People already 
hack core and modules in ways that are not supposed to. That's part of the normal site building mm -hmm. process, unfortunately. So I think we can extend those concepts here. We could have the way of automatically tracking how many modules extend a given class. These problems are getting more knowable. When all we have is hook something <coughs> alter, it is difficult to know what is being altered. It's a lot easier to grep all of contrib for extends entity base. Mm -hmm. um, we could have a good citizen module tag and perhaps an application process for uh, domain access is a good citizen module. <laughs> please, please run its tests. Please run its tests um, when core patches are made because if it breaks a good citizen mo module, we don't want that patch. Uh, or that patch mm -hmm. needs to look at the, the failing tests in the good citizen right. modules. I mean, I, I'm just it's, spitballing yeah. here, but but there are <laughs> ways that some of this responsibility can be shifted so it's not just, hey, core, <laughs> hey, already overbooked core mm -hmm. maintainers, you have a new problem. In a, in a sense, this is Contrib's problem. You could say everything is internal, until you until you contrib or you individual sites tell us that you need this to be public. I think that we should. I, I like the idea of the feedback from contrib. Mm -hmm. I think we still need to have a minimal API tags set for mm -hmm. eight point zero, just to give contrib something to work with. Sure. But I agree. Let's keep that small. If we're not sure, leave it normal, which mm -hmm. is the probably won't change, but we're not going to you know cross our heart hope yeah. to die on it. And, and if you are writing a contrib module or a site-specific module and you want to extend something that's not tagged as API, mm -hmm. file an issue. If you don't, you're doing the equivalent of hacking a module and not filing a mm -hmm. patch to D.O, which people do. People, yeah. people patch their modules and don't post those patches to D.O. And that's that how that kittens is, die. That is, a, that is how kittens die. <laughs> and and you're, shooting your, you're shooting your future self in the foot when mm -hmm. you do that. Um, you are shooting your future self in the foot now if you extend a class that is not tagged as API and you don't tell anyone. People will do it. People will mm -hmm. extend classes and not tell anyone, but they are shooting their, their future selves in the foot when they do it because their site will break when that mm -hmm. class changes. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely the ability to gather more data and more automation around this is definitely a win. I think we have time for one more and then we'll go to lunch. Um, so before you uh, talk... Who's interested in having a meeting on Friday at the Sprint about this topic to start drawing up some guidelines? All right. <laughs> so Friday at the Sprint, uh, we'll set up a table or something um, and start drawing together some recommendations that we can post. Uh, and if you're not going to be a part of that, still come to the Sprint on Friday because we've got a release to get out, dagnabbit. <laughs> and um, last comment. I really like the idea of the feature release. I think this is the way to go. And so we don't have to wait for the full uh, mm -hmm. release cycle for uh, Drupal 9 to be out. But there are like so many contrib modules um, out there in Drupal. Um, I love the work all the maintainers are doing. Do you expect the full support from uh, all the maintainers that <laughs> if something is released in 8.1 or 8.2, do you expect them to go back to their module, look at what they are using and what has been changed so they can be changed? Some yes, some no. That's why we need to get this communication out and then restrict ourselves and not break things on contrib if we can possibly avoid it, which means core developers are going to have some pain dealing with, hey, I actually have to support something for a change. And it's about time the core team felt that pain. Um, I say this as a member of the core team. <laughs> <laughs> um, if somebody is uh, going to release some security um, patch or something <coughs> in their uh, components, how would that fall in our release cycle? Would that uh, be a feature release or security release for Drupal? The odds of a Symfony security release at this point uh, breaking an API are extremely slim. So I would roll those into our security releases. And I know our security team and their security team are in contact. I don't know details of it since I'm not on either security team. Um, but some coordination around that. So. You know, they release a, a security release, we get that re security release out ourselves immediately would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so th there is conversation happening around that. So since it isn't really in topic for Larry's talk, um, to Chris's question about <laughs> um, what we, the kinds of things that we do put in 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, as opposed to just what kinds of changes we'll make, 
um, and, and, and how we manage that process in the issue queue. Um, that's, that's something that we're, that we're starting to explore. We've just started doing more of now as we get close to beta. So if you're interested in talking about that, um, you can come talk to me. We can have a little mini boff if you want. I have booth duty at the Aquia booth from noon to 2 today, so like right after this. And um, you're welcome to come by. There's like even a seating area where we can hang out and talk about stuff. And we have a whiteboard. So um, if there's anyone here interested in that, please, please stop by. And, and I would love to talk about it more. And if you look at the slides you, from my uh, prog talk, uh, I had lists there of just long lists of things that I felt were totally legit to add an 8.1. I've already got a long list myself of things I want to add an 8.1 that's just I felt that was off topic for today. Uh, this is a, just a small question, I guess, but I wanted to get it since you're in the room, Jess. Um, is there a reason why we can't um, tag certain things um, now as API candidate kind of things and actually get that discussion from contrib maintainers now um, rather than waiting for an 8.0 release and then having that kind of six months really, uh, discussion before 8.1? The, the trade-off there is just in terms of resourcing for core developers. I think that is actually a great idea, and I think that the beta would be a time to, at like beta 1 to RC1 would be a time to, to start having that conversation with contrib developers because that the beta is, that is for them, right? Um, but the, the, the trade-off, of course, is just in terms of the, the actual work it takes to to do those things and and whether or not that time could be otherwise spent and I, I think it, it it also but on the other hand it could be a great opportunity to get actually get contrib developers mm -hmm. looking at the core code base and saying like these five things are APA are they sufficient and that gives that also a branching off point for them to get involved and help resolve those critical so mm -hmm. that actually is, is probably a good idea I, I just don't want to make it a requirement for the release or, or like mm -hmm. a, an expectation for the release I think that it's an opportunity but yeah. Yeah. And that, that's another place where I really think we need to uh, get subsystem maintainers driving a lot of this conversation because they have the one little piece that they can focus on for that. Now, there are people who are subsystem maintainers for eight different subsystems, but that's a separate problem that already exists. It's not a new problem. But you know, having the Q system, it has a maintainer on it who doesn't maintain anything else. Let him drive the conversation for that piece. It's a nice small conversation, and we're done. That helps break things up further. We need more subsystem maintainers. Yes, please. If you're looking for a way to contribute to core and you have time and passion and you will stick with it, also come talk to me right after this in the exhibition hall. Yes, please. All right. We're over time. Let's go have lunch. Yay. <clears throat> yes. And please do follow me on Twitter, follow Palantir on Twitter, sign up for our mailing list, all that kind of fun stuff, uh, and so forth.